At this time, it is my privilege to invite Michael Rain of the Western Producer to join us to take us into uh, to introduce our guest speaker and, and to moderate question and answers at the end of the session. So, turning it over to you, Michael. Have, thank you for joining us. Is my microphone on? That's the most important part of these these meetings now. So, yes, your microphone is on. Then, then, I, then. Then, then I'm winning. I think I'm winning. Then I'm uh, I'm also winning because I get to uh, to introduce Murad uh, Al Khatib. Uh, I've I've introduced Murad oh, I, many times would be the best way to describe it over the years at various events and uh, and uh, I've, uh, you know it's uh, since 2001 we've uh, we've all uh, we we've all heard uh, I think uh, Murad speak and we've uh, or m most of us anyway. And the influence he's had on our industry is uh, is obvious. Uh, coming at it from a, a media standpoint, um, in the ag media side, I'd, I'd have to say, um, uh, you know, we've uh, we've probably uh, we've probably kept a lot of farmers busy reading uh, reading uh, the uh, about Murad and uh, and the industry that he's really helped build. So we. Uh, if, if I was if I was to introduce him properly, probably in this group, I'd just say, "Well, it's Murad, and you guys, you know, just you know, you know who he is." But um, from from the, I mean, from the earliest days, we saw that uh, that Murad was uh, he described himself as an entrepreneur, and uh, there aren't too many entrepreneurs that actually get to describe themselves or not. Now, I guess he can describe himself now as the uh, one of the thirty most fabulous entrepreneurs of the last thirty years. Most fabulous is, is a great term, uh, and not something we hear in agriculture a lot. But um, no, he—I mean, if we think back to the Saskan days, uh, starting out, uh, this book is almost full of stuff for me to, to leaf through and and speak about. But uh, an industry largely based in—I mean, a pulse industry, but a largely based, uh, at least in, for the, wearing my farmer hat in southern southern Saskatchewan uh, on lentils and peas. A uh, bit, a bit, a bit of chickpeas thrown in, but the lentil business. I mean, we could grow them, but they had to have some place to go, and it was critical to be able to. I mean, we had we had the opportunity to have that that uh, that crop to rotate to, but we had to be able to actually get it to market, and uh, that's that's where Murad comes in as uh, stepping in and, as the entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur that's, uh, I mean, he's he's grown that uh, the business uh, AGT food and uh, and ingredients from what was uh, really, you know, in his mind to the basement to the and and something a lot bigger, um, almost a billion dollars bigger, uh, employing a couple thousand people, 650 I think ish uh, actually work in Saskatchewan. And moved into not just exporting, but food processing, and this and the wonderful world of, world of proteins, uh, and the uh, the fractionation or milling of proteins, has expanded dramatically. And of course, um, uh, he's he's involved as an entrepreneur in that as well. Beyond all that, if I mean, if I list off all of it, it, it would be a long a long list of accomplishments and roles. But as a leader, he's uh, we we see him at um, Arctic. I mean, he's been the chair of the Arctic Gateway chair, and that's the the Port uh, Port of Churchill uh, project. Uh, advisory roles to ministers of trade and agriculture, chair of the Ag Agri-Food uh, uh, Strategy Roundtable uh, federally, chaired the uh, Asia Pacific Foundation. It, it's a long list, and uh, and and. Because of that, there's a lot of well-deserved accolades. From uh, we look at the Globe and Mail, referred to him as the Entrepreneur of the Year. He stayed on. Murad stayed on on focus, on target. When he wanted to be an entrepreneur, he he did it big. Uh, Saskatchewan Order of Merit, uh, Oslo uh, uh, Business uh, 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 Peace Award. He's uh, World Entrepreneur of the Year. Uh, the uh, UN uh, uh, recognized him as a uh, global citizen laureate. Uh, Profit Guide magazine, that's where he was uh, recognized as being uh, one of the 30 most fabulous entrepreneurs. And th this is a guy from Davidson, Saskatchewan. So uh, um, I'm from Wilcox. That's maybe a more humble beginning than, uh, than Davidson, but it's a bit, these are humble beginnings. These are, these are small town, small town prairies. 
And uh, I think one of the uh, the most important award he got was from the Western producer, probably the one of the 44 innovators who shaped prairie agriculture. And uh, my tongue was firmly in my cheek there, but we recognize uh, we recognize Murad's accomplishments uh, as an entrepreneur in the ag sector right from the very beginning. So uh, um, I'm not going to delay this uh, this much further, but uh, uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce Murad uh, Al Khatib as as your keynote speaker. Thanks very much, uh, Michael. Thank you very much for the kind uh, words and. You know, it, it, it's always a, a pleasure to speak uh, to an audience like this of, you know, people made up of of uh, folks that uh, that take their professions and their their careers and their, you know, for their families from the sector that I've also, you know, uh, dedicated my life to uh, to serving. And, you know, certainly uh, it has been, you know, quite, um, you know, rewarding to come from, you know, those rural roots in Davidson and you know, it's nice that you kind of gave that background. And I always like to tell the audiences when I start that, you know, I come from, you know, what I would say was a family of uh, community leaders. And, you know, my mother and father uh, immigrated to this country in 1965. And my father came as a rural uh, doctor into Davidson and spent, you know, the better part of 35 years in that community. And I always like to start, uh, you know, off by also talking about my mother who, came as a young bride, learned to speak English, watching Sesame Street with us kids. And in 1976, she was the first ever uh, immigrant Muslim woman elected to a rural municipal council in Canada. So to be elected, if you think in 1976, that uh, at that time to be elected as a woman in the RM of Wilner, and she served 27 years, you know, in that. So, you know, at my dinner table uh, growing up, it was all about agriculture. It was all about the community. It was all about, you know, how agriculture was changing in the uh, 70s and 80s. And, you know, what I'm going to spend a bit of time today, you know, talking about is that, you know, I'm going to spend some time, you know, talking about how we um, we look at the, uh, the sector overall and how we're, you know, going to be looking at where we're going, I think, because I think that's much much more important than where we've been. So just to kind of give you a, you know, a little bit as, as, uh, as Michael mentioned, you know, from that basement of my home startup in, uh, in uh, July of, of uh, 2001. So this July the 30th, it will be 20 years, you know, since I took that piece of paper down to an office and registered a blank company and started off with a vision to build. So we're now about 1.85 billion in sales. Uh, from that one humble plant in Regina that we built, there are now 45 manufacturing, processing, and handling facilities in five continents, you know, over uh, 2,400 employees. And we've kind of underwent a bit of a transformation where we went from being a small Saskatchewan private co to being a public company on the Toronto Stock Exchange. And then we actually privatized the company again, where we bought it back from the public with uh, Fairfax Financial, the Ontario Pension, and we're growing it again. And so it's been very exciting to kind of be involved with a company like Fairfax and, and running the global ag business uh, that we're running today. So as you can see, you know, again, um, we've actually taken a bit of a different view of the world in terms of not only looking at processing, but looking at logistics, food processing, and truly developing a global value chain. And I think that that's an approach that takes a great opportunity for Canada as we continue to go forward. So, you know, what drives me uh, is really the opportunity and the challenge that we see by food production targets. I mean, if we meet 9.7 billion people by 2050 and middle incomes rise in, in Asia to $33 trillion by 2030, we have to produce about um, the same amount of food in the next 40 years as we produced in the last 10,000 years. So as an entrepreneur, that makes me excited. But as an entrepreneur with a reality setting in, it makes me nervous. It makes me nervous to think about the mountainous uh, 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 task at hand that will not only be based on food production, but be based on an integrated approach at agronomy, technology, innovation, production, reduction in food waste, 
you know, and proper, uh, you know, value chain uh, development as we look forward. So that agri food dynamic is really what's going to be driving the sector in Saskatchewan and in Canada and in the world. And I mentioned kind of those two drivers. You've got the traditional market, meaning the growth in in uh, in population, but then you have this new driver, which is the health, sustainability, and nutrition element. You know, which ultimately is going to be a major part of the future for Canada. And and when I say very not boldly, actually, Canada will serve a consumer in the future completely different potentially than the consumer we serve today. As we look for those higher value markets in the world as incomes rise, that is where our future should be in this country. Now, again, uh, speaking to agrologists and speaking to people who are in the sector and have a scientific background, you understand the sustainability picture, the nitrogen fixation, the low energy requirement, the water use efficiency of our crops. And you understand as well the opportunity as we look for food companies to meet the global demand of the new consumer that carbon footprint and carbon indexes you know will end up being something that will be desirous of the new consumer of the future so some of you who've heard my story before you know hear the story of the young entrepreneur who had a a wife uh, my wife Michelle who was 6 months pregnant with our twins and I quit my job in government and I moved to the basement of my house to start this company called Saskan Pulse. Well, those twins are now gonna be 20 years old this year. And uh, I can tell you that they are very indicative of that consumer of the future. In particular, my daughter, Sarah, my son, Tarek, maybe not quite as aware, but my, my daughter, Sarah, is a very typical new consumer of the future. She is environmentally aware she is not an environmentalist. There's a difference. She's aware of water. She's aware of pollution, carbon. She's worried about the future of our planet. She cares about the food that she consumes. She cares about the food labels. She wants a mum's pantry food strategy on the foods that she buys. She wants to see on the food label things that she can find in her mum's pantry. She doesn't want food products that have additives and chemicals and modifications. So this is the consumer of the future. And you know, when we look at that consumer of the future, we realize, and we look at that opportunity to produce that food in the next 40 years, Canada is a global agri-food partner. And we make a lot of sense for the world because we have abundant natural resources. The basic staple building block of responding to the global food requirement is going to be that ab abundance of land and water, right? And, and in this province, you know, we are, I hope, going to see quite a transformation, you know, with the proposed irrigation project and with the proposed ability to use our freshwater resources to dramatically improve access to irrigated lands in our province, you know, as we continue to move forward. We have a strong network of R&D, sophisticatedly diverse uh, consumer base. Our producers are early adopters of technology. We have reliable access to capital and inputs, a relatively low use of pesticides per hectare, political stability, goodwill, and a strong primary and secondary processing sector. So all good assets in our toolkit. But when we look at the constraints, we do have some constraints, undervalued uh, value chain, you know, for a nation of our size of production to only process 50% of our agricultural output is a problem. And that lack of investment in processing infrastructure, relative low productivity, you know, of our farm sector and uh, government spending primarily on risk management rather than productivity enhancing investments. We don't have good trade agreements as much as we, we try and say we do. Three of our five biggest potential export markets are lacking uh, you know, preferential trade agreements and comprehensive economic trade agreements with the EU and the new agreement with the US need to be fully implemented. And regulation is a major problem and burden in agri-food where the growing regulatory obstacle to trading with US, China and India, you know, on the tariff and non-tariff side and our continued regulatory juggernaut in, in Canada with 
you know, multiple silos of regulation with CFIA, Canadian Grain Commission, Health Canada, you know, and other uh, regulations that are not necessarily properly coordinated are really putting up barriers to our growth. Technology and innovation offers a major opportunity and a major transformation in agriculture. So as we look at how technology will affect the face of ag exports over the next 20 years, Canada actually has an opportunity that very few countries have. You know, I like to say try uh, implementing digital agriculture at scale on one acre farms in India. You know, we have an opportunity here with farmer, um, you know, scale and with the input suppliers, off takers and value chains linked in a value chain, you know, big data, uh, IOT, blockchain, sensors, data collection, analytics, artificial intelligence, these will all ultimately allow for more sound decision making, uh, allow for the capture of data that will allow us to quantify sustainability and will also allow for, you know, the measurement of the gains in which we're having both on productivity and in our overall agricultural ecosystem which ultimately will measure things that consumers will be willing, we hope in the future, to pay for if they're properly tracked, certified, and, uh, and able to be uh, verified in the system. So, you know, when I look at the pane on the right, and I, I want you, when you look at the sky, I want you to see the world instead of just the clouds. And I want you to realize that Canada's uh, ingredient and food have a reputation in the world as safe, quality and trustworthy. And Canada has that opportunity to be the first stop on the protein highway. And that protein based foods and pulse based foods and, you know, the three crop rotation based food processing sector give us a major opportunity in this province. So when I look again at the assets, I mean, the plant based foods, fuels and biomass, you know, become a major opportunity on a three crop rotation of wheat, canola, and pulses. And, you know, when I look at that ability to look at processed foods, ingredients, biofuels, and then the biomass area is quite interesting as we look at total plant utilization, you know, in the processing, you know, whether it be a utilization of flax straw for biomass or whether it be use of wheat straw, you know, for, uh, you know, pulp and paper production. There are a number of different opportunities where you know, we expect that these three particular areas, you know, could provide, you know, very material growth in our economy, you know, as we continue to move forward in, uh, as a country. So, you know, when I look at, you know, our uh, system, you know, we've also taken a number of steps that, you know, are trying to react to what these trends are going to be. You know, some of you that have been following our company for the last couple of decades are probably scratching your head to find out why would I want to own, you know, short line railways? Why would I want to own, you know, rail consolidation centers and terminals and all of these other things? And, you know, in the bulk grain handling business, people want to own this in order to have logistics. We want to have logistics, but we've actually built out in our strategy a bulk handling uh, rail based system that is completely capable of identity preservation, traceability, right back to the farm and right into vessel hold. So, you know, if you think about what we've done with our mobile grain system, and, uh, you know, not, maybe not known to many, uh, this year we completed construction at Delisle, Saskatchewan, of what I would consider to be one of the most major rail projects in our province in the last decade. It was the construction of six three kilometer rail tracks and the uh, the uh, construction of a 1200 ton per hour grain processing facility. Now, all of the grain collected in our short line railway systems come to Delisle, where we clean from one rail car to another. No grain ever touches a silo. No grain ever commingles with another, uh, you know, grain. And ultimately, each individual rail car unit is a distinct traceable unit that we can trace right into vessel holds. So this system was responsible for what we believe to be the first ever glyphosate-free certified vessel of Durham wheat 
that went to pasta manufacturers in Italy, for instance. And this is all part of the future, you know, of this, in addition to the building of our container yard in Regina, which was a $35 million partnership with CN Rail, where we have identity preserved, traceable, containerized access for food manufactured products going to packagers, canners, wholesalers, retailers, and food ingredient users around the world. So we have to start to think differently, you know, about the way that we look at, you know, the agricultural production system, that we've got these crops, but we have to start to look at trends and we have to start to look at, you know, again, how do we start to implement things like traceability, identity preservation? How do we measure and quantify? How do we digitize? And then how do we actually add innovation and processing technologies you know, into producing ingredients and food products and semi-refined food products for manufacturing and consumers around the world. So when we look at, you know, overall and we look at our Western Canadian operations, you know, we recognize now that what we've tried to do now is create two different systems. We've tried to create at scale and our Canadian businesses have been interestingly um, from 2000, uh, 19 to 2022, in that three-year period, AGT is actually doubling the size of its Canadian business. We go from 1 million to 2 million tons of handling in our containerized. And it's interestingly, about a million tons of container and about a million tons of bulk vessel. And so, you know, when you look at that system, what we've tried to do is implement a system that's fully traceable for all our products from farm to customer. Because as we create this system in the future, you know, consumers will ultimately value it as will food processors, as will regulators for everything from food safety and traceability, but also to the measurement of sustainability and carbon intensity. So, you know, if we look at the Lake Diefenbaker irrigation project, you know, again, it has the potential to increase pulse, durum and canola yields and short lines are key to collecting and consolidating traffic. So when I served as an advisor to David Emerson on the Canada Transportation Act Legislative Review, and I was the main advisor on rail and grain, we talked at length about short line railways consolidating traffic. And, and less than one year after I completed that report, I bought my two short line railways and we took over operations of the Hudson Bay Railway at the same time. So if you look at, you know, again, the irrigation project, the only rail access for those lands planned to be uh, going into that project, you know, without uh, trucking at great distances is our railway systems. So again, that complete ability to be IP and traceable, you know, gives us an opportunity to continue to implement a vision for grain handling that hasn't been implemented to date in, in, uh, in our country. So, you know, that, uh, that uh, hub is complete that I talked about, you know, and, and what we're ultimately trying to react to is changes in the agri-food products in the food system in key markets, right? Agricultural commodities are market and it's changing the world. There's a drive to modernize sectors around the world where consumers are demanding convenience, nutrition, value, and farmers are producing crops that maximize their return and create sustainable opportunities. So while agri-products are commodities, they're key to security. They're key to well-being and prosperity of their populations. And COVID-19 has elevated the importance of food and food systems in the eyes of foreign governments around the world. And I think that that's quite an important uh, opportunity as Canada starts to try and get more um, bandwidth and attention from our large trading partners. So when we look at, you know, again, vegetable protein, you know, this becomes a very big opportunity and plant-based foods is going to be a major opportunity. So we've been talking a lot about protein and I did even earlier in my presentation, but I really want to focus everybody on plant-based foods to recognize the potential of canola, of wheat and of pulses in the three crop rotation. So I'm going to do a little bit of a case study on how we've tried to attack this, right? You've got consumer trends and you've got food companies and the consumer trend is protein as a positive image, you know, there's a very big difference between vegetarian and uh, flexitarian, but the consumption of plant-based foods and diets are growing. 
right? The rise in allergy to certain foods, consumer demand, nutrition, muscle, satiety, weight loss. These are all trends that we think have strong fundamentals. And the food companies are reacting. Non-GM, gluten-free, vegetarian, sustainably sourced ingredients, protein claims, right? Ingredients derived from vegetables and protein-based ingredients are growing dramatically. So there is a big difference between plant-based and vegan. Plant-based is a term associated with positive dietary choices. They can fit into a wide variety of diets. Vegan is a specific lifestyle that is often associated with dietary restrictions. So, you know, I think that when we look at that plant-based food market, it's supposed to grow from 12 billion to 28 billion in a six year period. That's 15% annual growth rate. Okay, we like that growth profile for Saskatchewan. We think that that will move the needle at the farm gate. So where pulse ingredients are being used, it's in snack foods, meat analogs, batters and breadings, pasta, dairy, pet foods, you know, all of these alternative uses. It's almost like the corn milling industry 40 years ago, right? That's where we sit today on the development of new opportunities in the plant-based ingredients. So, you know, when I look at what we're doing now in our innovation platform, it's we're taking crops from Saskatchewan and we're transforming them into, uh, you know, split products first. So split peas, split lentils, split faba beans. Then we're going into uh, fibers, flours, granulated flours, proteins, and starches. So, you know, that's that fractionation business that was mentioned by Michael earlier. But, you know, again, that is really only step one of what we need to continue to do. Step two, and where we're focusing a lot of attention now, is in what we call texturized pulses proteins. So that is the production of texturized pea, texturized lentil, texturized faba bean proteins that are giving us the various applications for the non-meat and uh, non-meat analog uh, opportunity. So in essence, just to kind of simplify it down, we take those crops and we transform them into powders. We separate the powders into the protein starches and fibers. And then we produce through high heat extrusion systems, chunk strips, slices, and granules. And ultimately those chunk strips, slices, and granules are used in different applications, depending on what they're being used for, whether it be pork uh, stir fries, plant-based burgers, the chicken, mock chicken nuggets, and plant-based chilies to give you more of the chuck, you know, uh, meat uh, type consistency and texture. Now, part of the key is we have to continue to focus on more natural ingredients. Part of the opportunity is as we look at the plant-based uh, type foods today, you know, the ingredient decks aren't simple like what my daughter Sarah likes. So part of that innovation is how do we take more naturally produced ingredients and how do we combine them to have four, five, six, seven ingredient you know, nutritious, tasty, affordable foods. So we're going down the path, you know, taking byproducts and we're trying to brand them and we're trying to introduce them into uses. For instance, veggie pasta and veggie crumbs. Veggie crumbs are used as panko and fine breadcrumb replacements in batters and breadings. And veggie pasta is made 100% from yellow pea starch which is the byproduct of our protein extraction. And I can tell you, you can boil veggie pasta for 16 minutes and it still stays al dente. So that gives it a tremendous advantage in frozen meal applications. It's gluten-free and it gives it a high heat uh, resiliency to, to uh, canned applications as well, whether it be canned soups, canned pastas, or frozen uh, reheat pasta opportunities. So this is a new launch that just happened in the last uh, couple of months with our ingredients. Kashi, uh, as you all know, is a great uh, cereal brand. They've launched the Kashi Go uh, keto-friendly grain-free cereals. And again, you can see leno protein, chickpea flour, pea protein as three of the top four ingredients. So these are the kind of things that I think will start to move the needle as we continue to go. Snacks and non-dairy replacements. So whether it be uh, chips, crackers, uh, veggie sun chips, non-dairy milks, uh, creamers, you know, all of those types of opportunities continue to get store placement and, and opportunity. 
So we all see the opportunity. And what I wanted to do was take the opportunity with all of you to give you a bit of an update on the economic strategy table. So, you know, I was asked by the uh, Prime Minister and the Minister of Innovation to continue my work. Uh, I was the chair of the agri-food strategy table in the previous version, and I was one of two chairs that was asked back to continue my work. So I, either I'm a glutton for punishment or I guess they I feel like I did an okay job. And so, you know, what we're expecting is we're expecting to continue our work in 2021 with a new version of the economic strategy tables to be convened. And we're going to be looking at the post-COVID economic environment and the post-COVID industrial strategy in agriculture. So, you know, again, the old strategy tables were announced in 2017. There were six uh, initiatives. And, you know, what followed from that was what they called the Industry Strategy Council in 2020, made up of the nine table chairs. So I was on that committee, along with Monique LaRue, the, uh, the former uh, chair of Desjardins Financial. Uh, she was an amazing chair of this uh, particular initiative. And we released a report to the uh, government in uh, November of 2020 that really outlined a nine sector uh, industrial strategy for Canada in a post COVID economic circumstance. So, you know, again, the opportunity is there, you know, for what we would call, you know, uh, an opportunity to uh, restart, uh, recover, and reimagine the sectors of our economy. So, restart would be, you know, getting those sectors like tourism and hospitality and the airlines, uh, you know, restarted. Recover is take the sectors that were suffering and recovering and allow them the opportunity to recover. And sectors like agriculture are, you know, doing relatively well. We need to reimagine how they looked at, uh, at the opportunities. So for me, you know, when I look at priority themes, it's market access, infrastructure and regulation, innovation and value add, technology and digitization and skills and labor. So, you know, those recommendations that we made, uh, you know, continue to hold true today. It's about agile regulation, innovation, competitiveness agenda, diversity in our labor force, you know, the development of agri-food markets and a state-of-the-art transportation and digital infrastructure. So if we're ever gonna realize the digital potential of our sector, we need broadband reliably across the country. It has to be modern and there has to be an infrastructure plan that gets our products to market. We have to take the oil off of rail and put it in pipes and we have to put agri-commodities on the rail and get it into a system that is predictable, reliable, and uh, allows us to develop and support the Canada brand. So the Strategy Council work uh, you know, has been completed. The new Minister of Industry, uh, Minister Champagne, has asked us to continue our work as we continue to work on the strategy stuff. So when I look at agriculture, you know, it's all about planned trade corridors and gateways and digital infrastructure. So I'm hopeful that in our budget in April, we're going to be seeing a replenishment of the National Trade Corridors Fund. We're going to be seeing initiatives aimed at agile regulations and economic consequence of regulation. We need to recognize the opportunity for women, youth and First Nations in our sector. And we need to uh, you know, focus more on value added. Right In the pulses sector, we've announced 25 by 25, which is 25% of pulses to be milled in domestic milling by the year 2025. So, you know, this uh, rich renewable potential of agriculture is an opportunity to tackle the decarbonization of the economy. So I believe strongly that we're going to see renewable fuels and the production of renewable diesel with a low carbon intensity and the production of, of uh, sustainable aviation fuels made from canola as major generational opportunities for agriculture in our country. So I think that, you know, again, uh, things are bright and, and um, I'm looking forward to the next 20 years, you know, uh, now that I've finished my first 20 in this sector. So I say to my wife, I'm only 48, I've got another 20 at least. And that global race to protein is on. So we've trained hard, we have a good lane, we have a good coach. We're feeling really good about the race because Canada's brand is strong, there's fundamental demand. The innovation scaling of food processing is critical. So we need to get away from the commodity ghetto and we need to get into the value added so we can tap into that $33 trillion middle class market in Asia. So Canada is a natural partner and the market opportunities for agri-food products exist. We just have to grab them, capitalize on them because if we don't, someone will. 
So, you know, again, that's, uh, you know, kind of the the general, uh, you know, presentation. So I think that it's, uh, it's you know, very safe to say that um, it is a exciting opportunity, uh, you know, for our sector as we go forward. So I'm going to stop there and uh, I'm assuming uh, one of our hosts will tell me that you can see me again and the screen is not there. Michael, are, are we good? Uh, we're looking good right now, I think. Excellent. Now on your on the right hand side, I know you've got the opportunity to see some questions and answers, but if uh, folks can't see them, uh, um, Mike Say was in there and answered uh, uh, one of the one of the questions that came up inter came up. But um, oh, here come the first of the the, the questions and uh, or comments. So uh, Kelly Kattenbach says uh, we need to get away from the commodity ghetto. Love that she says. Uh, so it's uh, Katie. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, Michael. I'm going to make a comment on that. I mean, it's it's a bit provocative, right? But I think we have to be recognizing the fact that. Agricultural system was based on a bulk grain handling uh, system. You know, again, a large part of the entire network was built in the Canadian wheat board days. You know, where ultimately we had centralized marketing and a very limited crop rotation. And you know, when we had the advent of special crops and the you know scaling of those acres. I mean, you know, I remember when I built Michael the plant. You know, that we talked about when I built in Regina in 2001. I mean, there was only about 50,000 tons of red lentils grown in this country, and we built a 100,000 ton capacity for splitting, right? So, you know, again, I remember going region to region and talking to growers about converting into red lentils because, you know, ultimately the world consumption was there. So the commodity, you know, mentality is, uh, is there, but special crops have helped to move that. But I think there's a big opportunity on canola and wheat you know, as well that, you know, uh, again, people know me as lentils and, and pulses, but, you know, we're really involved now in Durham. And, uh, you know, we think that, again, the uh, monetization of canola beyond, because the canola sector's already moved and oil crushing is prevalent, but there's even more we can do now. It's renewable fuels. And what about the monetization of meal? I mean, the opportunity to take canola meal you know, into high value aqua feed ingredients, high value feed ingredients, and texturized protein for human consumption. Look at everywhere soy is, canola can be, you know, on our monetization of our byproducts. So these are the opportunities, Michael, that will not only move the needle, we're talking about working smarter, not harder. It's what we're already doing. What if we as an economy could generate five or seven billion dollars more from what we're already doing that exactly that exactly can you know uh can make a lot of sense in terms of farm gate all the way through the value chain uh, and 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 uh, anybody who's interested uh, read, read my editorial this week uh because it, actually it's it, that's uh, that's okay. one of the highlights so I got lucky today. Uh, Ross McDonald would like to, would wondering if you could speak to the nutrient density of food products and how that might impact uh, demand estimates in the, in the, in the near future. You, you know, I think that, uh, that certainly, um, you know, the focus on nutrition and health, you know, um, it's interesting. We're seeing a lot of, of uh, strong interest by the food companies in natural biofortification. So we're looking at, you know, again, the natural presence of micronutrients and vitamins and, you know, again, the digestibility, you know, is much, uh, much more uh, efficient than the adding of micronutrients and vitamins after. And so we see that kind of opportunity for natural because, you know, let's say, for instance, Michael, you want to add iron into a formulation. You know, if you add iron, you have to list iron on your label and the percentage intake of iron would be listed on the food label. If you added an iron-rich crop like uh, lentils and you achieved your percentage uh, daily intake of iron in that product, you don't list iron on the label, but you list it on the daily intake, which is, again, viewed positively by the consumer. So I think that, again, that becomes uh, quite an interesting opportunity 
you know, when we look at that uh, that uh, that nutrient profile, you know, and that desire, and the ability to 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 use those to shorten the decks uh, on the nutritional side, I think that's really really quite uh, an opportunity. Michael, I can't see those questions. So if you want me to look somewhere, you're gonna have to tell me where uh, where to go. Otherwise, you can traffic cop me a bit. I can, um, or I could just repeat them too. It um, sure. doesn't take me very long. So we have a hand up from Don uh, Saloff. Uh, Don, you've got a question? We can come back to that if it shows up. Um, can you comment on the, uh, uh, Blair McClinton would like to know if you can comment on the long-term uh, potential for shipping from Churchill. Yeah, you know, um, it's interesting. Um, so Churchill, for me, when I look at it, is definitely a very viable, you know, surge port for Western Canada. I mean, when I look at that region of, of uh, Eastern Saskatchewan and uh, Northwestern Manitoba, Again, the tidewater access at Churchill is, is really quite a strategic advantage. When I look at, you know, the September, Oct August, September, October shipping uh, season in Vancouver, we've always got a constraint. And when I look at, you know, the competitiveness of Churchill over Thunder Bay, Churchill has a strong role to play in that window. The challenge, Michael, we have is just the limited season. You know, right now we're looking at around mid-July to about end of October. Uh, I can tell you I sweated a little bit, uh, you know, a couple of years back when I, you know, shipped a vessel out of Churchill around the 11th of November. And we were literally down to looking at the ice maps to make sure we could get through before, you know, things were freezing up. So those are, you know, we were pushing the envelope a bit on that uh, year. Uh, but, you know, that season's extending. I mean, we're into single year ice now. And, you know, from that perspective, you know, with proper icebreaker uh, deployment, the government of Canada is looking at more icebreaker capacity by 2023. If you take icebreakers in, in May, and again in November, you could actually uh, extend that season from June, you know, through to end of November. So when you start to get to that, you know, July through November period, now you've got a five month window. Again, again it can move the needle in terms of providing an alternative or a pressure release valve for Vancouver that I think will definitely help Farmgate return because it will keep the basis, you know, narrow. It will keep it, uh, you know, in check. Whereas with that freight constraint, that basis widens quite quickly and quite, uh, quite uh, exaggerated at times. So Churchill is definitely part of the long-term strategy. We're advocating the government to consider the Pacific Gateway, the Atlantic Gateway, North-South Corridors, and the Arctic Gateway as viable needs. I'm glad to hear that about Churchill because Vancouver has been talking about raising prices quite substantially and we're gonna, and we know that all new prices come into the farmer, which is bad for me personally, but uh, that means they have less money to spend on agrologists too. Yeah. Um, so it's been, uh, so David, uh, David McCurcher is asking, IP's uh, been done for decades with malt barley and IP wheats, uh, such as Warburton and hard white varieties. Do you think the well-documented production and practices can get a premium from consumers or will uh, we see government accurately find ways of compensating sustainability practices or should we not expect the market to pay? And I mean, that's been one of my, my bug bears for years is, these are all great things and I've taken advantage of them, but to someday they just become just commodity grain again. Is it just become- Well, well and, and, and you know, it's interesting because again, we, we right away ask the question of, I, I see the question here, will we see the government accurately compensate for sustainability? You know what, Michael, I think that the uh, ESG, you know, requirements that companies are putting in place, reacting to not only the consumer demand, but also, to the requirements by capital flows. You know, I'll give you an example. The New York Pension Fund has come out to say, you know, to uh, let's say the transportation industry, if you don't meet your environment, your social and your governance obligations and your targets aren't lofty enough to meet your targets in the next decade, we can't invest in you. 
So, you know, ultimately, I think that it's going to be a combination of government regulation. You know, if I look at uh, biofuels as an example, it's not going to be just the clean fuel standard and the carbon taxes that are going to drive the need for renewable fuels and the decarbonization of the transportation industry. It will be the ESG focus of the pension funds and capital flows that will ultimately drive that target. So the, the, that's the long answer to a short question, which is, yes, I believe that if we don't get our act in order and be ready, when the premiums are there, you can't just react and say, I'm going to track it. So at the end of the day today, you know, what we are, are inherently advantaged in agriculture because of our scale, there is a direct compensation for data collection and analytics today. That is seed rates, chemical rates, yields, which ultimately give you a payback for doing it. The data collection and the sustainability side will be ultimately, in my mind, gravy. It will ultimately be, ultimately be icing on the cake. And when we look at that ability to collect the data properly and consumers are willing to pay for it, those companies and those uh, farmers that have the ability to deliver it will get into much more what we would call closed loop, you know, production systems. And I think ultimately what's been done in malt barley and IP wheats can be done in pulses and can be done in other special crops. Uh, Don uh, Salop, if, if you, un I think you can unmute yourself now. I'm on. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, Don, go ahead. Hi, Murad. Uh, I'm a forensic agrologist, so I'm looking at it more from the production side, and you're talking a lot about the demand side. Uh, my, my question gets around to, if we're going to supply these volumes of uh, product into the food industry uh, from a grain point of view, what production systems uh, do you foresee in your vision? Is it uh, some form of what we have now with using some fertilizers and some pest control products, or is it organic? Uh, where are you at? Yeah, listen, uh, I am all for maintaining all of the tools in our toolkit. Okay, and, and to me, the focus is going to be on natural products, not on organic. Okay, organic to me, again, no knock. I mean, those that want to do it, uh, there will be a market and, you know, we may or may not play in it. But to me, it's about natural, clean label food products. And so, you know, again, we're focused on ensuring on label use of our, of our products. You know, glyphosate is a really good example. I mean, glyphosate is a tough one right now. But, you know, when we look at the sophisticated food companies, they are not saying no glyphosate. They're saying no pre-harvest glyphosate, right? It's about glyphosate residue. It's not about use of glyphosate as a burn off or, you know, on a, on a uh, you know, regular toolkit uh, basis. So, you know, I think that what we've got to do is we've got to be focusing on, you know, better management of the tools that we have in the toolkit. You know, so, so do I believe strongly, you know, Don, that it would be interesting to be able to see, you know, uh, whether or not, drones flying and scanning, you know, cropping systems and being able to recognize pests of concern and to apply micro droplets of herbicides or pesticides versus broad application of those spraying systems. Could that be advantage? Well, I think it'll lower our cost. I think it'll lower our residues. And I think ultimately it could boost yields. So those are the kind of things that I think I'm hoping that, you know, good entrepreneurs and uh, good, you know, farmers will be able to implement. And, you know, if you look at our history in the development of zero minimum tillage technologies, as an example, air seeders and the like, we've proven our ability to take complex problems, solve them and then scale them. And our short line manufacturers and, and the technology providers have proven to be quite, you know, capable in uh, Western Canada and we've supplied to the world. I'm hopeful that that kind of uh, in ingenuity is going to continue, and I'm pretty optimistic it will. So that's where Mur I see things as natural, clean label, much more than the the uh, other. Mur Mur a follow-up question on that: that the, the uh, I, I've just finished a major project this summer, and uh, I, I discovered that, uh, and I've, I've known this for a while, but 
basically the Ministry of Health, uh, PMRA, has overtaken all of the oversight on uh, the, the pesticide use in, in agriculture in Canada. Yep. Uh, there's some big problems that are creating with that. There, you, I go out and I try to find some science-based research on different aspects, and uh, it's a real challenge. Um, any comments on how we can get some, uh, I guess, more authority back into the Ministry of Ag so we can have some of that research you're talking about. So we can we can have uh, research that that affirms that we're uh, using those products properly and, and and you know using them well. Well, you, you listen. You're hitting the nail on the head of what I said earlier about the siloed approach to regulatory, you know, in our country. And you know, again, uh, I feel like I'm getting bandwidth on on you know senior decision makers in government understanding that. So, you know, the uh, that division you just mentioned, PMRA is another. So PMRA, Health Canada, CFIA, CGC, you know, the modernization of the Canada Grain Act is, is upon us. We need to get back to, uh, you know, science-based, you know, decision-making. We need to get back to, you know, taking down these regulatory silos that we're operating in because that regulatory burden that's being created, you know, ultimately is going to result in unintended consequences where... Farmers are going to lose uh, tools in their toolkit because there's ultimately a, you know, public, listen, I'm all about public trust and public safety. So I'm certainly not suggesting we should drop our standard on that. Mm -hmm. But there doesn't seem to be the proper, I agree with you, the proper research and the scientific background that's being done to make those decisions in a lot of cases. And, you know, we also have to recognize that we don't have to do it all. You know, recognition of scientific standards internationally is something else that needs to be worked on and coordinated. Hmm. You know, work that's done in jurisdictions where we trust their scientific regime, you know, should be able to be easily adopted in our country. And, uh, you know, again, we've got to recognize that scarce resources in science and R&D need to be better utilized to give us a more chance to make better decisions. Thank you. Dave Cobbin would like to touch on that with a question about where will research funding come from? I know you guys do a lot of research and a lot of R&D on your food products and uh, but uh, anyway, he's wondering where, where the where the money is going to come from in the future. Well, again, I guess it depends which bucket you're playing in. I mean, in crops, you know, I do think that, uh, you know, as we continue to scale, you know, the challenge on a lot of the special crops is just, you know, the acreage is still very, very limited. So, you know, when you look at, you know, research funding there, I'm still a strong advocate of the, you know, checkoff model that we have. And, you know, with the proper, you know, investment, um, you know, of checkoff dollars and uh, the proper coordination of work, you know, uh, with the universities, Crop Development Center has been a huge asset for us. You know, guys like Dr. Bert Vandenberg and Tom Workington and the, and the, and the, the crew at the CDC have been transformational, you know, for us. So hopefully that industry you know, government, uh, or sorry, the industry uh, partnership that we have, you know, collecting that check off and then giving it to the grower association so they can deploy it will continue. I think on the food side, what we're seeing is, you know, a lot of private capital flowing in. And if I look at, you know, our R&D center in Saskatoon, which which many people don't even know exists, you know, it's a, uh, in, the, in the middle of Stonebridge, there's an AGT office that is largely actually an R&D center. And you know, there's about 5,000 square feet of R&D space there that is doing work for probably 12 of the 15 largest uh, consumer products companies in the world. So, you know, we are there developing things, you know, with companies like, you know, General Mills and Nestle and Unilever and and Beyond and Kellogg's and, and uh, you know, a whole bunch of really Maple Leaf and a whole bunch of very interesting applications. So, you know, that is what we would call joint development agreements and joint funding. So, you know, a lot of cases, uh, you know, we've got private sector partners and our money, you know, going into those R&D initiatives. And frankly, you know, what we did with the protein supercluster, you know, I was one of the architects of that. You know, it was a vision that was born in my boardroom where we were talking about things like pl total plant utilization and the production of plant based foods. Those collaborative funding programs that develop scale are ultimately going to be how we get more funding. So where the funding comes from is scale. 
right? The, the more we stay in the niche, the more it's tough to attract R&D capital. The bigger we get and the more we're able to take niches and scale them, that will attract the funding. And, and I think that private capital will flow into this at, at quite a strong pace. Chandra Grill would like to know, the uh, what, how do you see the future of GM in Canada? I know that's largely tied to the future of GM globally because customers yeah. want what customers want. Well, you know, it's interesting uh, because I've been kind of termed to be over the years, Michael, a non-GM crusader. And I always say, you know, if you're a strong entrepreneur, you market to your strengths. And at the time, I mean, there, there there's no GM pulses. So why would I have been out promoting the virtues and attributes of genetically modified food products when I didn't have any to sell? So, you know, that's, that, that's just the first clarification. But listen, this is not going to be an answer that may be popular with a group that is much more scientifically grounded than many I speak to. But you know what, for me, what it comes down to today is the science isn't the only driving uh, decision-making item here. At the end of the day, the consumer will decide. And what we're seeing on the GM side is, you know, we're seeing more and more of the food development pipelines that are going towards non-GM if there's a good cost-effective functional alternative. So if you've got a non-GM alternative or a GM alternative, you know, we actually see the non-GM alternative, you know, being preferred in particular by the multinationals that are marketing similar products in multi geographies around the world. So a Nestle and these others, you know, again, a lot of what we're doing in pulses is replacing so soy and corn. And again, one of the uh, reasons for that is the non GM nature of pulses. So it is an alternative. So do I think that there's an opportunity on the marketing side still? Absolutely. You know, canola is a perfect example. I mean, the, the, the canola oil side and the health attributes have trumped out that, you know, G, a GM, uh, you know, concern, but certain markets won't, won't look at that. So there's a limitation on, on, on what we're going to see. I still see emerging markets around the world being strongly influenced by Europe. And you know, from that perspective, I still see a strong influence that's going to uh, going to you know continue to hinder that uh, that opportunity. But you can't ignore the agronomic benefits, and you can't ignore the uh, the gains that we're having. And so, you know, there's another school of thought that people think that that ultimately will be the winner, that the uh, need to supply food to 9.7 billion people will ultimately win the GM war with the non-GM war because we're just going to need the product. So, you know, I think that, you know, Canada, we've kind of straddled the the in-between, you know, relatively well. I mean, we've, we've managed to kind of uh, stay where we are, but what it's creating is the need for better processing. Like I got to tell you, even in our bulk vessel programs, our new Delisle plant, you know, the rail consolidation center that I talked about, big thing of what we're trying to do is make sure we can clean canola out of lentils. Right, because as we're looking at, you know, taking into markets where there's a strong uh, concern, Turkey is an example. They went the uh, the far, you know, pendulum swinging the wrong way approach. You know, the presence of uh, GM canola and lentils above the European Union tolerance is considered an act of bioterrorism. So it is actually a very, very serious issue. Right, it's actually not sustainable. We've went through the Canadian government. They've, you know, obviously uh, launched their their concern with the approach Turkey has taken, but Turkey's not backing down. So these are the type of things that give me pause and worry as I'm trying to sleep at three o'clock in the morning sometimes. And that, those are those are things too. Uh, yeah, the uh, bio bioterrorism does seem like a, a bit of a, a bit of a strangulum swing the wrong way, Michael, for sure. But um, now, and Dave McCurcher would like to actually just related to that question. He says, how's, how's country of origin labeling? How's cool affected you guys? Because uh, when we have Italy, uh, we have the U.S., uh, uh, um, we have phytosanitary uh, non-tariff trade barriers out there. There's, uh, uh, I mean, we all, we all know that it's just a matter of uh, we are an exporter and as an exporter, whether it's processed, unprocessed, it doesn't matter. We're always going to run into to 
countries doing what countries do when they have more than they need or they have other markets or sometimes a different axe to grind. But how, how's it, how does that affect, I mean, you guys deal with it every day, I presume. Well, I think, yeah, I think that we've got to recognize that, uh, you know, uh, country of origin labeling was a, you know, an Obama, Obama policy and we have Biden in the White House now. But, you know, uh, it's interesting, you know, that, that uh, while we were heightenedly sensitive about Trump, you know, again, we're probably going to see a, a heightened by America type you know, system. So, you know, Michael, we're seeing this all over the world, as you say. Agriculture, we've got to recognize, is the most political business in the world. Because at the end of the day, governments all over the world will continue to protect their domestic agricultural farmer base, which in a lot of cases, ruling political parties enjoy strong rural support. So, you know, again, that's votes, right? We see that. Uh, maybe we don't see that so much in Canada, you know, where we've got a strong Ontario and Quebec focus of our government, you know, but, uh, but uh, in other countries in the world, agriculture is very political in that regard. That's going to continue to lead to tariff and non-tariff trade barriers. You know, what we're hopeful for, though, is that we return to a more bilateral agricultural agenda. You know, we've been urging the, the federal government to recognize that comprehensive economic trade agreements are complex. They're very difficult to, to negotiate and they're very difficult to get the attention of countries like India and others. But a bilateral agricultural treaty could provide a lot more reliability and predictability to the phytosanitary and the non-tariff trade barrier side of our relationship. And as COVID-19 has magnified food importance in the eyes of foreign governments, this becomes a opportunity for Canada to punch further above its weight. So this, I think, is the opportunity that we're hopefully going to see as we continue to move forward. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking they're going to put out the hook for me right away here, but um, uh, we had one last question uh, from uh, Ken M. Uh Is Africa a viable, I mean, is Africa a viable potential market for Western Canadian ag products? Uh, now, we know North Africa has long been one, but uh, the rest yeah, of Yeah, and, 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 you know, where we see right now, I mean, we are seeing, you know, regular shipments into North Africa, and, uh, and then South Africa as well, you know, has been a very strong market for us. We've got pockets of opportunities in places like Angola. But where we're seeing the Africa potential in the, in the value chain is really much more as an origin. Right there, you know, we're seeing uh, Tanzania, Kenya, Malawi, Mozambique, you know, Ethiopia as microclimate regions for things like uh, dry beans. And then for crops that we're not growing, I mean, pigeon peas, black mat pay. You know, so we've got a very active program in uh, Tanzania, Malawi, Mozambique, and then we just built a new factory in Johannesburg. So AGT, we just uh, built a uh, a brand new, you know, about 100,000 square foot processing plant in Joburg. So Africa is definitely a, a market for Canada, both on the sales side, but I think Canadian companies, you know, have a look at the opportunity. I believe that this is a century for Africa. So I do believe that if it's a century for agriculture and a century for Africa, those two will actually intersect, Michael. Okay. And I, we haven't seen any more questions, and that'll probably make our uh, our hosts quite happy about that. I'd just like to say you messed up my notebook once again. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> too many, too many, too many great ideas. Um, so I guess I can turn that turn that back to uh, uh, back to SIA. Thanks, Michael. Thank you.